Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. I am Joe Rusnak, Assistant Director of Programs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our third of our virtual lectures, generously sponsored by the Jarzombak Family Foundation, Marianne, Mark, and Michelle Drum. Now, as you probably have heard me say in my previous two lectures, uh, this is a new platform. Uh, this is called Crowdcast, and uh, though we are pretty on top of things. This may be your first virtual lecture with us. Uh, so if you do experience any problems during our uh, lecture, uh, particularly audio or video, uh, there is a help button on the top right hand corner of the title bar all the way to the right. And you can click on that and uh, help you out with that. And if at any point in time you would like a full screen view of what's happening uh, on that same title bar all the way to the right, you will see a small shadow of an outline of a box and that will then make you full screen. Uh, tonight, uh, we welcome Edward Acorn as he presents his book, Every Drop of Blood, the momentous second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's, uh, drawn uh, from uh, Washington, DC on the eve of Abraham Lincoln's historic second inaugural address and all the complexities of the Civil War. Uh, it is a Pulitzer Prize finalist uh, for commentary and winner of the Yankee Quill Award. Uh, and uh, Edward Acorn is the vice president and editorial editor of the uh, Providence Journal. Uh, he is the author of two critically acclaimed books on baseball history, uh, my personal uh, favorite topic, uh, The Summer of Beer and Whiskey uh, in 59 and 84, both of which we have here at the Redwood Library. So if you are interested uh, in some baseball history, uh, once we open up, those will be available uh, to check out. Uh, without further ado, uh, Ed Acorn. Ed, how are you this evening? Good, I'm great. Hello, everybody. It's a, it's a great honor to be speaking to you through the kindness of the Redwood Library in Athenaeum in uh, Newport, which is uh, one of the most beautiful libraries in America. And I was hoping to speak to you all in person uh, and sign your books, uh, but I hope I will have the opportunity sometime in the future when things are a, feel a little bit safer. But uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us here tonight. I'm sitting at the uh, desk where I wrote Every Drop of Blood. And I thought tonight I would uh, show you some pictures, which I think we're bringing up now. And uh, I'm not sure I see those, but. <clears throat> yeah, Ed, you're good to go. OK. Um, Good, all right, and then uh, I'm going to uh, read a few passages and I will leave a good deal of time for questions and answers. As Joe mentioned, my previous uh, two books focused on another aspect of 19th century history, which was the great game of baseball. Uh, 59 and 84 was about the grittiest of competitors, Old Haas Radborn of the Providence Grays, who won more games in a single season than any pitcher in Major League history. He was so ornery that he was the first man ever photographed giving the middle finger. And you might notice what he's doing with his left hand there. Uh, I think that book did have some impact when a copy of Radborn's 1887 baseball card showing that pose was auctioned off in 2017. It sold for nearly $10,000, which was 24 times its original estimate. Uh, my second book was The Summer of Beer and Whiskey about a wonderfully idiosyncratic German immigrant named Chris Von Dere, who helped save baseball. And that book sold very well. And I think the title didn't hurt. But of course, anyone who wants to write about the most remarkable figures of the 19th century has to be drawn to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln loved to tell stories, uh, some of which I am best advised not to share in public. But he once told a tale about a man who was probably Lincoln himself a fellow whose features the ladies would not call handsome. When riding through the woods, he met a lady on horseback. He waited for her to pass, but instead she scrutinized him carefully before saying, well, for land's sake, you were the homeliest man I ever saw. Yes, madam, 
but I can't help it, he replied. No, I suppose not, she said, but you might stay at home. I can relate to that story. I, I've often thought I'm a bit of an interloper in the field of Lincoln scholarship. I might have stayed home too. Some 15,000 books about Abraham Lincoln have been published, which is more than about any human being other than Jesus Christ. Uh, across the street from Ford's Theater in Washington is a museum store with a literal tower of books about Lincoln glued together. I admit I found that daunting. How could I have the nerve to add anything more? Well, what made me proceed was my feeling that there was a gripping story about Lincoln that had never been told in this way. This story is basically 24 hours in Abraham Lincoln's life, from the evening of March 3rd, 1865, through his second inauguration, to the evening of March 4th, 1865, 155 years ago. This is a lens through which I think we can see, in remarkably sharp detail, the immense suffering unleashed by the Civil War, and to grasp the ultimate meaning of that war as Lincoln explained it in his greatest and most profound speech. Lincoln argued that all this misery was the price America had to pay for the evil of slavery. The great Southern historian and novelist Shelby Foote said, any understanding of this nation has to be based, and I mean really based, on the understanding of the Civil War. It defined us. If you're going to understand the American character, you've got to learn about this enormous catastrophe in the mid 19th century. It was the crossroads of our being, and it was a hell of a crossroads. That day in March, I believe, was the crossroads of the Civil War. It moved us towards an understanding of that great catastrophe, and it helped Americans aspire for peaceful coexistence in a more perfect union. As recent days have shown, that's a task that still challenges us. I believe a narrow focus on a historical event can give us an understanding that the usual omniscient historical view cannot. It brings us very close to the ground instead of viewing everything from 30,000 feet up. Studied in the course of one day, historical figures almost magically become flesh and blood, real human beings subject to emotions and other difficulties, including the politics of the moment. It becomes clearer they were groping in the dark and had no idea how things would turn out. With this forced perspective, we also get a stronger sense of how everything looked, sounded, and smelled. I love that. There's something else I noticed about this day. Some very fa famous people keep popping in and out of it interacting with Lincoln and each other, interwoven like a tapestry. I found that their perspectives also helped underscore the tragedy of that war, and their experiences reveal the gale force political winds that were tearing through America that day. I thought I'd read a few passages from the book to try to give you some flavor and then open the floor to questions. This is from the uh, prologue of the book, helping to explain what Lincoln was up against that day. By 1865, four years of Lincoln's brutal, unremitting pressure was at last breaking the Confederacy, but the price had been horrendous. Nearly 750,000 young men had died so far. Many rolled into unmarked graves far from home and loved ones. Countless thousands of survivors had been left, debilitated or horribly disfigured. When the war started, virtually no one had expected savagery on this scale, an appalling blot on a country conceived in liberty and dedicated to the enlightenment values of self-government and the peaceful resolution of political differences. Lincoln himself, a frequent visitor at Union hospitals, was horrified. As the president's friend Ward Hill Lamont recalled, it was the havoc of the war, 
the sacrifice of patriotic lives, the flow of human blood, the mangling of precious limbs in the great Union hosts that shocked him most, indeed on some occasions shocked him almost beyond his capacity to control either his judgment or his feeling. Lincoln had dedicated his life to the rule of law and the peaceful settlement of differences. He argued that each man, white or black, carried the spark of divinity and merited freedom. And then he presided over the wholesale slaughter of America's young men. The dead, the dead, the dead, our dead, or north or south, ours all. Our young men, once so handsome and so joyous, taken from us. The son from the mother, the husband from the wife, the dear friend from the dear friend, Brooklyn poet Walt Whitman lamented. And everywhere among these countless graves we see, and ages yet may see, on monuments and gravestones, singly or in masses, to thousands or tens of thousands, the significant word unknown. As Lincoln's first term approached its end in the winter of 1865, bodyguard William H. Crook recalled, death was on every hand. The black badge of mourning was seen on every side. And those connected with the White House where centered the entire nervous system of the nation, felt the strain of conflict, the grief and sorrow so poignantly and so constantly that it is no wonder gaiety and lightness of spirit were absent for the most part. One of the things I uh, try to do in every drop of blood is explain what Washington was like on that day. It was a sleepy southern city that had been transformed dramatically by the war, filled to the bursting point and not up to the task of hosting a massive centralized government. I thought I'd read a passage about that. This teeming slapdash city was not to everyone's taste. Of all the detestable places, Washington is first, Manhattan lawyer George Templeton Strong complained. Crowds, heat, bad quarters, bad fare, bad smells, mosquitoes, and a plague of flies transcending everything within my experience. Beelzebub surely reigns here, and Willard's Hotel, which is in this picture, is his temple. Foul-smelling animal pens dotted the city. The streets were full of rooting hogs, dirt, decaying horse manure, and rotting animal carcasses that waited to be picked up by the city carrion cart. Dilapidated and unfinished structures teetered along handsome new ones. Washington was, quote, a cesspool into which drained all the iniquity and filth of the nation, wrote a New York Times reporter who arrived in 1862. Quote, it was filled with runaway Negroes, contractors, adventurers, office seekers, gamblers, confidence men, courtesans, uniformed officers shirking their duties, and the riffraff, the outscourt scourings of all creation. A Michigan soldier visiting the Capitol in November 1861 found it dominated by three large groups of people. The first was soldiers. The other two, he wrote in his diary, were politicians and prostitutes, both very numerous and about equal in numbers, honesty, and morality. Nothing much has changed in that regard. The worst of Washington's physical features was surely the reeking city canal, which ran from 17th Street south of the White House, passed along the north end of the mall, and veered south at the foot of Capitol Hill in two branches that fed into the Anacostia River. Built at great expense to accommodate fat barges and encourage trade with the West, it was a majestic 80 feet wide at points but it never drew much traffic, and by the 1850s, whatever use it once had as a canal was over. Now it was nothing but a stinking open cesspool. 
attracting swarms of flies and mosquitoes for much of the year and emitting a stench of human waste that on the worst days reached the White House. So that was uh, Washington in Lincoln's day. Not quite as lovely as it is now. One of the uh, key characters in the book is John Wilkes Booth, who stalks Lincoln at the inauguration, probably with an intention to kill him that day. He was a charming, very popular actor who captured women's hearts and was generous and kind to children. But he came to symbolize the terrible hatred for Abraham Lincoln that millions of Americans felt and that finally led to his murder. Lincoln, uh, Booth thought that Lincoln had betrayed the founders and shredded the Constitution. Quote, how I have loved the old flag can now never be known, he wrote. Oh, how I have longed to see her break from the mist of blood and death that circles her folds, spoiling her beauty and tarnishing her honor. But no, day by day, she has been dragged deeper and deeper into cruelty and oppression, till now in my eyes, her once bright red stripes look like bloody gashes on the face of heaven. Another leading figure in the book is the poet and journalist Walt Whitman author of Leaves of Grass, then widely considered a very dirty book. Whitman had been in Washington doing government jobs to survive and doing some freelance articles for newspapers, but spending most of his free time tending to wounded soldiers in the city's dirty and crowded hospitals. I find it fascinating that before almost anyone else, uh, Whitman grasped Lincoln's special and even mythic qualities as a quintessentially American hero. And I explore that in the book. How I love the president personally, he wrote. He has a face like a Hoosier Michelangelo. So awful ugly, it becomes beautiful with its strange mouth, its deep cut crisscross lines and its donut complexion. Abraham Lincoln, of course, is at the heart of the book. I thought I'd read a short passage about his childhood that has always struck me powerfully. I dedicated this book to my own mother who died of cancer long ago when I was in my early 20s. Childhood trauma had scarred Lincoln. When he was only nine, he lost his mother, Nancy, to a sudden ghastly illness from what seems purest fate for drinking the milk of a cow that had happened to chew on a plant that was toxic to humans. Quote, all that I am or ever hope to be, I got from my mother, Lincoln had written of her. She was intellectual, sensitive, and somewhat sad. In an act of gross irresponsibility, his father, Thomas, almost immediately thereafter, left young Abe and his older sister, Sarah, in their log cabin in the wilderness of Indiana putting them under the care of an inept teenage relative so that he could return to Kentucky to find a new wife. The children were soon filthy and on the edge of starvation. During the many months their father was gone, they survived on the dried berries that Nancy had put aside and on whatever they could find or kill nearby. It was a wild region with many bears and other animals still in the woods, Abraham remembered. Sarah, who endeavored to cook and keep house, often sat by the fire and cried. Later in life, Lincoln wrote of the sad, if not pitiful, condition of the two. When he revisited the place of his childhood in his late 30s, he did not indulge in fond nostalgia, but rather recalled the little boy's abject terror. In a stanza of the poem, he felt stirred to write, The Bear Hunt. When my father settled here, t'was then the frontier line. The panther's scream filled the night with fear, and bears preyed on the swine. Some of the most damaging ordeals any child could suffer, the loss of a mother, abandonment, nights feared with, filled with fear, loneliness, filth, cold, and hunger, 
were among Lincoln's formative experiences. And when he was 19, his beloved sister died in the agonies of childbirth. In an 1862 letter to a grieving child, he wrote, in the sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all. And to the young, it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. I have had experience enough to know what I say. The sorrow never left him. Lincoln's melancholy never failed to impress any man who ever saw or knew him. The per perpetual look of sadness was his most prominent feature, his law partner recalled. Um, the great freedom fighter, Frederick Douglass, is a major figure in the book. One of the themes of every drop in bl of blood is Douglass's shift in his perception of Lincoln from a waffling politician devoid of character who cared little about blacks to a radical champion for African-American rights. I'll read to you a little about his first meeting with Lincoln when Douglas was furious that Lincoln had approved of official discrimination in paying black soldiers less than white soldiers. Douglas arranged to meet with Lincoln in person. Given the fierce racial prejudice of the times and the bitterness of his, his invectives against the president in print, Douglas approached the session with some trepidation. At the White House, he found that the stairway was crowded with applicants, and as I was the only dark spot among them, I expected to have to wait at least half a day. But within two minutes, he was ushered into Lincoln's office, finding the president seated in a low armchair with his feet extended on the floor, surrounded by a large number of documents and several busy secretaries. Lincoln immediately put Douglas at ease. I know who you are, Mr. Douglas. Mr. Seward has told me all about you, the president said. Sit down, I am glad to see you. Douglas was surprised. He later related, in his company, I never was in any way reminded of my humble or origin or my unpopular color. A remarkable thing at the time. Nonetheless, Douglas put, pulled no punches. When Lincoln asked him his views of the political and military situation, Douglas said he was most disheartened by the tardy, hesitating, vacillating policy of the President of the United States. Lincoln allowed that he might seem slow, but he did not vacillate. I think it cannot be shown that when I have once taken a position, I have ever retreated from it. On the question of equal pay, Lincoln argued with typical pragmatism that black men had larger motives for being soldiers than white men and ought to be willing to enter the service upon any condition. He knew that African-American service in saving the Union would make a powerful case for the final destruction of slavery and the recognition of their rights. While the inequality of pay was a necessary condition to smooth the way, Lincoln promised that it would be corrected over time. We have to make some concessions to prejudice, he said. I assure you, Mr. Douglas, that in the end, they shall have the same pay as white soldiers. Douglas was not entirely satisfied with his views, but left the meeting with a new appreciation for the president. At the very least, Lincoln clearly respected him and seemed to be genuinely interested in his perspective. Douglas continued urging black men to fight. Despite their lower pay, few to no opportunities for advancement in the ranks and a far grimmer disadvantage, the serious risk of being executed or sold back into slavery if captured by the Confederates. He recognized that if black men fought to save the nation, they would be making an almost unanswerable argument for full citizenship. Quote, shall colored men enlist notwithstanding this unjust an ungenerous barrier raised against them? <clears throat> we answer yes. Go into the army and go with a will and a determination to blot out this and all other means of discrimination against us, Douglas implored. Once in the United States uniform and the colored man has a springing board under him by which he can jump to loftier heights. 
Great man, Douglas. <clears throat> this picture shows the burning of Columbia, South Carolina on February 17th. <clears throat> Excuse me, on March 4th, which is the date covered in the book, General Sherman was still ravaging South Carolina, occupying the town of Chura. Researching this period, I was struck by uh, Southern white women's diaries and their fierce bitterness toward the Yankees and their desire to fight on. They had lost much and didn't want it to be for nothing. <clears throat> A 17-year-old Columbia girl named Emma LeConte pondered God's punishment for the Union troops. The word Yankee, she wrote, has become a synonym for all that is mean, despicable, and abhorrent. I wonder if the vengeance of heaven will not pursue such fiends. Before they came here, I thought I hated them as much as possible. Now I know there are no limits to the feeling of hatred. Here is uh, General Sherman who explained, we are not only fighting hostile armies, but a hostile people and must make old and young, rich and poor, feel the hard hand of war as well as their organized armies. Finally, I thought I'd read a little bit about Lincoln's great inaugural address that day. It was only 700 words long and could be read in five to six minutes and would easily fit in a column of type in a newspaper. It was savagely attacked at the time by Democrats who found it monstrous that a president would be talking about God's will, as if a politician knew anything about that. And the height of hypocrisy to talk of malice toward none when Lincoln was decimating the Confederate armies and crushing the South under his boot. Both sides in this war, Lincoln was arguing, shared responsibility for the grievous offense of slavery. Both sides had brought it to these shores, nurtured it, endured it, and sustained it. As a result, some four million black Americans had lived and worked under it under brutal conditions, suffering the pain and indignity of the lash, and perhaps more agonizing, permanent separation <clears throat> from loved ones who had been sold away. The founders had created a country that tolerated it, even if they hoped to set it on a path to extinction. Lincoln himself had declared on this very spot four years earlier, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. <coughs> Excuse me, but God had a different plan. Lincoln was freely stating that he had not been in control of the nation's fate, a confession of weakness rare for any politician. Nor could he say how much suffering the nation had yet to endure. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away, he said. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be drawn, paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He was quoting here the 19th Psalm, which calls on fallen man to humbly accept the will of the Almighty as beyond human understanding. What Lincoln was saying was astonishing. For the first time, an American president in an inaugural address <clears throat> was denouncing slavery as an unmitigated evil, speculating that God himself had rendered that judgment on it by punishing all Americans through this disastrous war. For the last four years, Lincoln had often repressed his hatred of slavery, 
keeping his focus on the political actions that would best advance the war effort and save the Union, carefully calibrating his actions to public opinion, to the intense irritation of such man, such men as Sam and Chase and Douglas. Now Lincoln was perhaps revealing his heart. Slavery he was proposing was so grievous an abomination that God had willed this enormous catastrophe on the people of America to end it. African Americans were stunned to hear his president speak this way. Negroes ejaculated, bless the Lord, in a low murmur at the end of almost every sentence, the New York Herald reported. Many wept, looking down into the faces of the people, illuminated by the bright rays of the sun. One could see moist eyes and even tearful faces, one reporter wrote. Moreover, Lincoln was suggesting that Americans had earned their terrible suffering and any still to come. All the treasure sunk into the war had been justly lost. Every drop of blood in this ocean of carnage had been justly spilled. <clears throat> well, that's a bit of a glimpse into the book. I hope you'll pick up a copy, which I'm told makes a wonderful Father's Day gift. <laughs> I also hope you'll check out my website, edacorn.com. And I'd be delayed, delighted to uh, take questions about the book or about Abraham Lincoln's views. All right. Uh, so, Ed, we do have a question from a gentleman uh, or person. I'm not quite sure. Just the letter S. Uh, oh, you still there? Perfect. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, here. Some or any of the research you performed for Chapter 10 of uh, Summer lead to your interest in writing uh, Every Drop of Blood? Well, I wish I could remember what chapter 10 of the Summer of Beer and Whiskey was, but I did very, um, I think I took much the same approach in the two books, The Summer of Beer and Whiskey and Lincoln, believe it or not, because I wanted to focus on sort of a narrow period of history to really draw out um, the passions and um, what people were saying at the time. I, I love um, going back to the original newspapers and getting a feel for what people really thought about Lincoln in 1865, and it was definitely not what we think today. I don't know if that's a, a sufficient answer, but... Um, we also have another question, uh, Richard Eason. Uh, were there any African Americans represented at the inauguration, uh, particularly on the dais? No, there were not. Uh, and African Americans were not permitted into the Capitol that day, believe it or not. Um, they um, were kept out. Frederick Douglass had to watch the speech standing in the mud in front of the... Uh, the platform, as you say. And um, later that night, uh, Frederick Douglass decided to attend Lincoln's uh, mass reception. Lincoln shook the hands of thousands of Americans at the White House. They all lined up and came in. And D Douglass decided to try to do that. And guards threw him out two different times, but he persisted and got in. And I write in the book about the scene when Lincoln sees Douglass. He says, here comes my friend Douglas. And he was very happy to see him and ask him what he thought of the speech. So that was, um, it gives you a sense for the racial prejudice that was still in force. This was after uh, votes to eliminate slavery, but people still didn't want to give uh, full citizenship rights to black people. Uh, we have another comment, um, or a question, I should say. Uh, can you comment on Lincoln's position on the relocation of uh, African slaves to Africa? Right. Well, Lincoln, uh, to, the, to his shame in the view of modern historians, uh, believed in uh, colonization of blacks, sending them to Liberia <clears throat> or to Central America, sending them out of America he thought that blacks and, and whites would never get along together. He thought there would be violence, there would be unrest. Um, he thought that blacks could not uh, compete sufficiently. 
in an American society, which is based on raw competition and capitalism. And uh, he came to uh, realize there was no support for this idea. Black leaders told him, this is our country. We're not, we're Americans. We want to stay here. And then when Lincoln saw the uh, performance of black soldiers in the Civil War, I think that opened his eyes to the, to the fact that black Americans are full citizens and deserve to be treated as such. And I think Lincoln would have uh, strived very hard to bl bring blacks into the mainstream of America had he lived. But uh, I just want to add, Douglas, Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass thought, this is one of the reasons Frederick Douglass thought very poorly of Lincoln early on, that he was supporting this uh, idea of sending them off to another country, which he thought was just disgraceful. Uh, and uh, along with that, we also had a comment while you were saying that by John O'Brien, colonization, uh, he offered them a voluntary opportunity, uh, never right. once. Uh, to force them back. Uh, which That's is right. A very, a very important distinction. Right. That's say. right. But he, but even offering it is pretty offensive. When uh, I mean, Black Americans said, even former slaves, we're Americans. We want to be here. We want to be part of America. So, uh, we have a few more actually. Quite a few questions. Um, Good. Uh, Nerio Ruiz, I'm going to get back to your question because I'm curious about that one. Uh, but we're going to get back to that in a second. Uh, Chaz Novo has asked, uh, did Lincoln uh, clear the second inaugural with his cabinet? Uh, and do you know what their response was uh, to his speech? Uh, I don't think Lincoln cleared it with anyone. He read it out loud to himself. And he didn't, he didn't uh, look to the cabinet for much advice. He... he he had a way of, um, he would listen to what they all said and then he would just do whatever he wanted. Uh, so it was very interesting that he, you know, he put this, Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote about the team of rivals, all these great Republican leaders he put on the cabinet, but he was a very private and confident man. And he just, uh, he would listen to people, but he would make up his own mind. And he didn't, I don't think he ran this by anyone from what I can tell. Uh, we're going to switch back to Neri Ruiz's question. Uh, you know, everyone needs to keep in mind that this is a time where the continental United States technically has two presidents operating within uh, it, within the, the, the borders. Uh, and uh, Neri Ruiz would like to ask uh, what was going on during uh, the same day uh, just in Jefferson Davis's camp? Yes, uh, that same day, I think uh, Lee was in Richmond meeting with uh, Davis talking about I believe the end of the war and Davis had a different view from Lee. Davis wanted to keep on fighting. He, he was in favor of even a guerrilla war, which would have been an unimaginable horror for America. Um, one of the reasons I think uh, Lee is worth uh, admiring is his position on this. He, he uh, decided he had to end the war at Appomattox. He gave it everything, but then he, he decided this is it. We can't fight on. And he set the example for the rest of the South to end, end the pointless killing at that point. And uh, that's, that's um, I write about Lee a little bit in the book and that's, that was quite a thing. But Davis was, uh, you know, I write about this in the book as well. Davis was vowing to fight on, and he said, "I will never bow my neck to the uh, to the North. Never." Nice. A um, couple more questions. Uh, William Hogan uh, has asked, "Why did Lincoln not do enough due diligence on the selection of Andrew Johnson as his vice president?" <laughs> yes. Well, he he seemed not to, didn't he? I mean, it's. Uh, Johnson had been a very, uh, he had been a, a senator that, well, let me, let me start off with the political landscape. Lincoln was a Republican. He was 
terrified he was going to lose re-election in 1864. He felt he needed to have a former Democrat or a Democrat on his ticket to make it look like this was the national ticket, not just the narrow Republican view. So he brought on uh, uh, Johnson, who was a former Democratic senator, and uh, Johnson had done unbelievably brave duty as the wartime governor of Tennessee, which was bitterly divided during the Civil War and was a very dangerous place. So Lincoln, you know, Lincoln thought he had been tested. He, um, and he very unkindly jettisoned his vice president, Hannibal Hamlin, who was a former Democrat, but he was a, uh, a good man, a solid man. And he brought on Johnson and Johnson, uh, as I write in the book, <laughs> turned up drunk at the inauguration and went into a rambling drunken speech that everybody said, oh my God, we have to hope nothing ever happens to Lincoln because we can't imagine this guy as president. So that's one of the great ironies of that day. Um, while you were commenting, uh, Nero Ruiz uh, uh, placed something in the chat. Uh, we're talking about Lincoln. Uh, his pressure to win re-election was also placed on Grant collecting some victories. Uh, in his opinion, the Johnson aspect was the political front, while Grant right. was the public opinion front. Uh, I don't know really much about Johnson's VP, but I would certainly agree with Grant in gaining victories uh, prior to his second right. election. The, the, the whole election really turned on what happened in the field. Lincoln had gone through a series of, or the nation had, these horrific, catastrophic battles where tens of thousands of people, thousands of people died and tens of thousands were wounded. And he just, he desperately needed some sign that this war was changing. And late in August in 1864, he was convinced he was going to lose. But what happened was Sherman uh, conquered Atlanta. He very brutally uh, moved everybody out of the city and the city burned to the ground. And after that happened, people said, oh, okay, we're going to win this war. So let's not change horses in midstream. And that, that's what uh, really catapulted Lincoln to re-election. Um, we have uh, one more question uh, from our audience, but before we ask that, uh, because it's more connected to current events that's happening, uh, I do have a question with regards to uh, Lincoln's opponent for the 1864 election, George McClellan, being the general of the Union Army for the first couple of years and not really gaining any victories for the cause. Um, what was Lincoln's opinion, if, if he mentioned anything, about his, his opponent? Did he, was, he, was he really afraid that he was going to lose to George McClellan? He, he was. Uh, he was uh, all his, Lincoln kept his ear very close to the political ground. He had uh, correspondents all over the country, and they were telling him, you can't win, you can't win. McClellan was very popular with the troops believe it or not, at, for when he was a general, he took, he, he took extraordinary care not to try to send them into, uh, into battles where they would get slaughtered. Lincoln had the view, look, we have to fight these battles as hard as we can. We can't hold back. And uh, because of his uh, tendency to hold back, uh, McClellan failed in battle after battle. Um, but he was, he was regarded as, you know, a bright young patriotic guy who was trying to preserve America as much as possible the way it was. And a lot of the Democrats didn't want to see blacks integrated <laughs> into American society, to put it mildly. And, uh, Lincoln had, uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was not popular in many parts of the North. So uh, the Democrats had a real shot of winning. That's, that's actually a little surprising. Uh, you know, in hindsight being what it is, that's surprising. Uh, yeah. And I believe our last question this evening uh, comes from one of our viewers, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> let's just say President Lincoln were to time travel uh, to today, 
Uh, what would he say regarding the current social unrest? Uh, current social unrest uh, generated by what's happening right now. Well, Lincoln was a, a very strong law and order guy. I mean, the Civil War was essentially a battle uh, to contain an insurrection. Uh, the South refused to accept the results of the election of 1860, and uh, he thought that would end America as we know it if parts of the country just seceded rather than accept the results of a fair election. And Lincoln, very early in his life as a young lawyer in Springfield, had written about the importance of the rule of law and the importance of not resorting to violence uh, to achieve political ends, because he said what the founders did was create a system where we could resolve our differences peacefully. And he believed all the way up to 1860 that slavery could be put on a path to its, its final destruction without engaging in a horrific civil war. So I think Lincoln would have looked at these uh, riots and so forth very askance at them. And he, you know, he used the troops in 1863, fresh off the Gettysburg battlefield, the march into New York City to suppress draft riots there. Of course, those riots were vastly worse than what we're seeing. On the other hand, I, I want to say Lincoln also had a long perspective. He would not, I believe, he would be horribly unhappy with the condition of black pe people in America, poor black people, the horrific crime in their neighborhoods, the, the terrible public schools we have in the inner city. And I think he would be working at the same time to try to try to change that and bring people together the best he could uh, to try to change these things. And Lincoln was unbelievably skilled at that, I think. I think he was able to move the country in a different direction without uh, uh, driving people, turning people off. And that's what he was able to do. Good. Well, that I believe is all of the questions uh, that have been asked. Uh, Ed, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I, I hope, uh, I know a couple of people have already purchased your book and they had it in hand during this lecture. Uh, I hope the rest of you uh, pick up Ed's book. Uh, it's gonna be a great read. Uh, get you a little bit of more information on uh, Lincoln's second inauguration, which we may not know a lot of since, you know, his term for his second one really didn't last too long, unfortunately. No, no. Um, great, great tragedy of history, great tragedy that uh, Lincoln could not be around to deal with the incredibly difficult challenges of reconstruction. And Johnson obviously wasn't up to it. He was too much of a hothead. So, um, yeah, and I just want to say to everybody, if you buy the book and I have an event um, <laughs> after COVID-19 is over, bring it by and I'll be happy to sign it uh, for you. And um, I hope, you know, I hope we get through this pretty soon and that we can start having gatherings again and, and sharing with each other that way. That would be very nice if we could uh, move on. Great, agreed. Good. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, sign you off while I say my okay. goodbye, to folks. Uh, again, pleasure uh, as always. And uh, we will most certainly be in contact, uh, especially with those two baseball books. I would certainly <laughs> love to know more about those personally. Uh, Ed, thank you again uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of your evening. Thanks, everybody. That was fun. All right, folks. And I want to thank you all again for joining us for our uh, third virtual lecture. Uh, if you liked what you saw this evening, we will be continuing our virtual lectures through the month of June and into July. Our next lecture is next Wednesday, and it's slightly different than what we have been doing. Uh, this is done by Dr. Edward Marquardt, uh, who will be uh, speaking about classical music. Uh, in a set of PowerPoints, he will most certainly be uh, playing some music. Uh, please check our website, redwoodlibrary.org, for all upcoming events and uh, news about uh, what we're doing here uh, at the library. Again, my name is Joe Rusnak, uh, the Assistant Director of Programs, and on behalf of the Redwood Library and all of our staff, thank you for tuning in this evening. We will see you next week.